Today's show is brought to you in partnership with Clear Motive Marketing. I co-founded this high-impact creative agency over 15 years ago. We deliver marketing that matters to our clients through our three-pillar approach. Number one, research that delivers actionable insights. Two, creative that attracts and engages new customers. And three, which is the backbone of our client success, the people, process, and technology that ensure efficient, consistent, high-quality results. We have great ideas and incredible creative, which is expected from a national agency. What makes us different is that we also simplify workflow, use technology to speed up projects, and recommend activities that achieve higher returns. There is a mountain of work that happens behind the scenes to produce what our clients take for granted, and that's exactly how we want it. Because great creative combined with well-organized operations is why we have such long-standing relationships. For example, Honda Canada has renewed their contract with us annually for the last 12 years. Our clients are market leaders, so they're incredibly competitive. Efficiency, performance, and consistent results are the only way to get to the top and to stay there. If you're not getting the consistent results you need, I can help. Reach out to me on LinkedIn or check out clearmotive.ca. Hello and a warm collisions. YYC, welcome to my guest this morning, Mr. Aiden Campbell. How are you doing, Aiden? I'm doing great, thanks. How are you, Dather? Ah, man, I'm amazing. Thanks for letting me flip the microphone. I recently had the opportunity to be interviewed by you, and that was a fabulous experience. And through that wonderful exchange, we said, hey, let's 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 turn the tables and let's do a deep dive on not only your business and what you do in the world and the impact you have on this amazing community that we share together called Calgary, but also getting into the, the realities of video marketing and creating content and the effort, the energy required, but the benefit. So let's... Uh, Let's, without further ado, let's let the audience into the tent. What is, you are co-founder and CEO at 2C Media and co-founder at Pronto. So let's start with 2C. What's 2C Media all about? What do you guys do in the world? And let's go from there. Yeah, absolutely. So taking you back seven years or so, uh, my co-founder and I were, uh, he's a creative director and I was a photographer at the time. And essentially we found the need that, you know, a lot of, a lot of companies just don't have access to great video content. And so, it, you know, video was coming up on, on Instagram at the time, uh, becoming more, more prevalent on social media platforms, that sort of thing. And it was just inaccessible to a lot of video, uh, to a lot of companies that didn't have access to, you know, the funds or, or the resources to create video content. So, um, that's where, that's where the idea was, was kind of stemmed from, you know, fast forward seven years, we've been creating videos for tons of amazing brands and fortunate to partner with a lot of creative people. And, and, uh, and here we are. So. Uh, ultimately, what we do th- these days is we design video solutions for brands that have, you know, problems that can be solved via video. Okay. Well, that, dude, we could, there, you just laid out my next 37 questions that I want to ask. <laughs> um, let's talk about the barrier of cost. Like, I think that's such an easy one. And I think like so many things in the world of, of, of different channels and different forms of media, oh, I want that. And then the, and I'm talking about from the client or from a business owner, oh, that would be amazing. And then all of a sudden they get sticker shock and it, slap, and it slaps them in the, in the face. Oh, I don't have 50 grand, 30 grand. Like again, some of the, you know, you, you see something on TV and you think it's amazing. You don't realize that someone spent a quarter million dollars, uh, to get that put together. How do you, uh, how do you, how do you deal with that challenge? Because you can't produce video for free. You, sorry. It's hard to produce it at a low cost because there's gear and there's equipment and there's a quality. What have you guys done to help just balance out that first big obstacle for so many companies? Absolutely. Yeah. I think the biggest thing that we do that's a little bit different than, than, you know, most companies that go into this space is that we like to understand what the, what the client is working with budget wise upfront. You know, that's the easiest way to, for us to identify how many resources can we put behind this? What gear can we use? How big of a crew can we have? You know, solving these, solving these problems upfront and just knowing how much the client is willing to spend on, on what they're willing to get is kind of the best way we, that we use to mitigate. Um, ultimately these days, you know, we're in the creator economy. You can spend $500 on a video. You can spend, you know, a million dollars on a video and we sit somewhere in between. Um, and, and we're always happy to recommend up and recommend down if, if you know that we're not the right fit, but ultimately just determining what are we actually dealing with from a budget perspective and how can we, you know, use you best utilize resources to create the best possible product for that customer. Fun question. <laughs> Fun in air quotes. You meet with 10 clients and you ask the budget question. How many of them have an answer out of the gate? Great question. Yeah, I would say typically three or four, uh, which okay. is right. which is getting better. It is getting better. You know, five years ago, you asked the same question and it was, you know, one at most. Um <laughs> But, you know, it's, it is really mandatory for us, uh, f- to, to understand that at least give it in a ballpark, um, so that we really know what, what, uh, what, what kind of wheelhouse we're dealing within. And I think ultimately it, it saves both parties time, 
you know, if we're able to nail that down, because if we're, if we're going to quote way too high and spend a bunch of time on a quote, or if, you know, we're just not the right fit because we're not, we don't have the resources for your project. Um, it's better to determine that out of the gates. And I think the more education up front required, you know, to that client and making sure that we're getting that information across up front, um, is just, is just going to be better for both of us long term. So we're in that room and I, I'm not one of the three or four. I don't have a budget. What kind of advice or what recommends, how do you steward someone to understand like, Hey, it's worth spending $10,000 because you're going to get to use it for multiple years. Or, Hey, if this is just a quick hit social asset that might be here today, gone tomorrow, you might actually be thinking about this in a way that it doesn't make sense cost wise. Like, again, I'm just throwing a few guardrails up just for the fun of it. Where do you start with a client to help coach them through that? And I'm really zeroing in on an audience that's like got their notepad out right now going, okay, I want to do this, but I've been intimidated. I don't even know how to approach it. Yeah, yeah, great question. I think I think the the hesitation that a lot of companies have that I've seen in the past is that a lot of them have been burned in video. You know, they're promised this big, this big shiny thing. And then maybe they get a portion of it, or maybe it doesn't stand up to par, or whatever the case may be. So really understanding, again, flipping the question, understanding where have the problems been for you in the past, understanding that problem, and then making sure that our solutions have, a, like you said, mentioned longevity. Um, multiple use cases is another thing we see often. Sometimes video productions are just creating one version, one asset. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't have longevity. It doesn't have versatility uh, in use cases. So we, we solve a lot of problems by, you know, if we're going to give you a two minute video, let's say we agree on a two minute video, um, that's not that's not the end. You know, we're going to give you snippets. We're going to give you aspect ratios for all the different social media platforms. A little bit of a strategy behind that, so that you can follow it. Assuming you don't have a you know a media company behind you. So um, I think ultimately just understanding the problem first of all, it, because a lot of a lot of companies just honestly aren't asking the right questions. And the more we can ask the right questions, then it's just proving the value that we provide uh, by understanding. I like what you said about we're kind of at an age where you've probably had an experience and unfortunately it might've been bad. Like, it's not like, Oh, I've never even thought about video. I don't even know what that is. That's not the case. What's not the world we live in, but oftentimes, uh, you know, maybe a, ca- a caviar taste with a beer budget or whatever champagne taste with a beer. Budget, I don't know, whatever, whatever that old joke is that floats around in the creative world, but, but I want that. I'm like, what? A hundred thousand dollars. Are you, are you, are you insane? You said something in there that I really loved. It's also thinking about it more than just, I got a two minutes. No, I have two minutes, but then I have 10, 15 second clips that I can use, that I can promote, that I can, you know, fill the ever hungry beast of content <laughs> and filling up those channels. And for a lot of companies, are they just not thinking about it that way? Or is that also the way you approach it to try to create more, a, a stronger value proposition for them to make the quote unquote investment? Yeah, I think I think ultimately these companies that have experienced this problem is that they're getting this this great. Let's say they had a great experience, they got a great product, they got a great two minute video, and and um, you know they're just not getting the views to it because they're not pushing it from multiple aspects. They're not yeah. using it from a campaign perspective. They're just kind of putting out a piece of content and hoping it works. And you know, if you spending... build it, they will watch. Not not true. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly it. You know, you need your you need your advertising behind it. You need all these short pieces of content to lead up. You know, it's like a it's like a sales funnel. Um, content is you know a piece of the sales funnel so i think ultimately just just that education really is what it comes down to i think a lot of production companies and and even marketing companies are just kind of missing that education piece which is like yeah we can produce all this great content for you and that may be true but um what's the other side where are the how are we supporting all of this other content that's happening how challenging is that for you i i compl- i couldn't agree with you more and at the same time you're the artist and your and your canvas is a camera. I'm, I'm dramatizing that statement. That's not that's my words, not yours. <laughs> but now, as a someone who's hiring you or giving you money, I don't even know what I have the expectation. But what I heard you say is, no, no, we give a bigger story. Like, yes, we know how to use a camera appropriately. We know how to tell story and narrative through film. But and we also can help you understand how to get value from that. Those skills don't always go together. So how crucial is it for someone even in your business at Two C to go? Oh yeah, yeah, no, no, we like. Us making you a good film or two minute, whatever, that's table stakes. Us helping you see how to create value from it. That's maybe a differentiator that doesn't always happen with the true artist mindset around creativity. So that was a long, elaborate way <laughs> to pose that, but you're nodding. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, I think realistically, the, the difference is that we were, we were those companies, you know, we were the company that was saying, Hey, we'll make you an awesome video for 5,000 yeah. bucks, you know? Touché. And I think, I think to the, our realization to be able to come out of that space was 
hey, where can we provide more value? You know, if, if a customer is only willing to spend $5,000, we know that's not a cap. We know there's got to be more that we can do and more that we can educate and more that we can kind of, you know, create value. And so that education piece came in and then learning and then, and, you know, providing more insights and that sort of thing. Um, and that took us from that $5,000 space to the 25 to 50. And I think, um, I think that's, it, it really is just kind of the, the value you're providing and, and not looking at it from an asset perspective. You know, we don't like to think about it like we're, uh, we don't provide, we're not providing you with a video. We're providing you with a solution. So a single asset is not, is not a solution to a problem that you may have. It's, it's a video. <laughs> Back to your exactly. Point. Yeah. So curious, I'm a professional creeper as we all are these days because LinkedIn is only one, a few keystrokes, a keystrokes away, co-founder and COO 2015 to 2020. And then I see a little break in between and I see you come back in 21, like now putting on your founder's hat a little bit. Talk to me a little bit about that journey. It sounds like listen to you talk, there's been some epiphanies and realizations around the way of like, hey, we're just doing video and that's not good enough. Talk to me just a little bit about that going and then coming back. That's a tough journey for a lot of founders as you become um, my words, not yours, maybe disillusioned or something wasn't working in your own company. So therefore you left, but then came back. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'll I'll kind of bridge a gap there. I didn't actually leave. Um, I was still involved. Ah. <clears throat> there was definitely involvement there for sure. Uh, that might be a little error on the on the paper there. But I think what did happen in that in that time period is that we were we were going through some transitions. We were starting another couple of companies and trying out a couple of different things, all in the media space, all photography or videography related. Um, and I think personally, um, I just I just wasn't sure where I fit into that kind of piece of the puzzle. Okay. Was it you know on this company on this side? Uh, is it a CEO CEO or am I? you know, a CEO or whatever the case may be. And so I think there was a lot of clarity in that time period. And this is, you know, coming into COVID and that sort of thing as well, where um, I think there was a lot of clarity for everybody going on at that time period. <laughs> and realistically, I just kind of came and uh, came back and and the the opportunity was presented by my business partners um, to take over as CEO with some, some kind of newfound, uh, newfound oomph, I suppose. And, <laughs> uh, and that's kind of what took us to where we are here today, but not without support from, you know, all the amazing people in the organization. So. Thank you for clarifying that LinkedIn doesn't always tell the complete story. <laughs> <laughs> Shocker. Just, hey, I read it on the internet and it must be true. Uh, looking back, did you start with, were you a photographer first, a videographer I, first? I was a photographer first. Yeah. I was a touring uh, commercial photographer for about four or five years before I uh, got Very into video. Cool. So I'm now listening because I want to get into the space. I'm super passionate about it. I love creativity. I love the creation side. When you signed up back, well, we can talk a little bit about even early days, for, but did you vision yourself as the co-founder CEO when you were the guy going, I just want to go and take awesome photos and I just want to do, do that? Because it's such a passion-driven job. So talk to me even a little bit about, uh, was that a hard road or did you just all of a sudden go, well, if I want to stay in this industry and go places or grow it or be bigger than just the guy with the camera, not that that's a bad thing, I had to learn these new skills. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think uh, this is something that I'm asked by creatives trying to get into the space quite frequently is, you know, how do you bridge that gap? And, and what does that look like? And I think there's a big distinction between, um, uh, well, maybe even three, but I, I would say a creative, you know, who's the photographer, or the videographer, or the solopreneur, or whatever the case may be, and, and they just want to go out and create awesome content. And that's, that's incredible. You know, there's, there's definitely a place for that. Um, and then, and then, but if you want to scale, if you want to do something, if you want to have crews, if you want to be able to provide, um, you know, a, a little bit more value potentially is you really do have to step into that other role or, or find somebody to do that for you. I find the biggest barrier that I hear from a lot of creatives kind of looking into the space and even some of our, our, um, you know, ex employees and that sort of thing have just determined that, you know, the business side of it is not necessarily that for them. It's it's completely yeah. different, and you hear this throughout any industry, which is if you uh, you turn a passion into a job, you know you kind of lose the passion for it. It's <laughs> certainly true. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't deny that whatsoever. I think it's just a different passion. I think to be honest, my transition um, was better for me. You know, I still love to hold a camera here and there, um, but uh, but I really do love the business side, and I think I found a new passion in that. So that transition became easy. But you see a lot of people in the industry who kind of enter because they absolutely love to create and they love to create amazing content and be creative and and come up with new ideas and that sort of thing. And there's certainly an element of that in what I do, um, but it's it certainly takes a backseat to the business side of things. And I let you know those creatives who are that way naturally um, kind of take that role. How much of an advantage for you having been on the creative side to have a have like I'm going to assume a very well and I've hung out with you a little bit a very high get it factor versus someone's like no I'm just going to pick a business this business seems interesting I'm going to start a photography business but I do not actually have a photography videography or that creative background 
I think it's a superpower. I don't know what's been your what's been your experience on that. Certainly important. Certainly important. You know, and I've seen it the other way around, where, uh, like you said, somebody comes in and decides they want to they want to CEO a creative industry or or whatever the case may be. And um, you know, I, I wouldn't say it's it's doomed to fail from the get go, but I do think you have an advantage if you've been. In <laughs> you the, wouldn't uh, say that, but you might imply it. You might imply it. <laughs> <laughs> I might. I might. I haven't seen it work overly well. I'll be honest. But um, yeah, no, I think it's definitely like you have to understand what you're selling. You have to understand it through through and through, right? Um, and uh, I think without without having that, you know, that prior knowledge of of creative, I, I, I mean, realistically, I just call myself a photographer. A lot of I wouldn't argue that uh, photographers are are artists, but um, to have that side of you, I think, and, and kind of understand it at the very least is integrally important to be able to run a company successfully in this space. I think there's no more role. I think there's a role. creativity and running a business. I also think go very hand in hand. They're just looked at very differently. <laughs> The amount of problem solving you get to do on a reg- on a regular basis, uh, I think, requires a higher degree of creativity. Obviously, in a different context than someone behind a camera or a paintbrush or a mouse or a you know a, a, Adobe <laughs> Creative Creative Suite. You went to photography school. Talk to me about business school. Did you have mentors? What was that transition? Because if I'm listening to this and go, yeah, I, I see myself as running the business, but holy shit, I don't even know where to start. What was your you know trial fall forward, fail fail fast, all that stuff, or did you have some specific people in your life that helped you on that journey? Yeah, great. Um, I, I d- yeah, I did go to school for both photography and and uh, business. Um, I, I you know oh, right on. Okay, cool. Mm-hmm. I think I think I think school is a great thing. Um, I think I think it teaches you things that aren't tangible. The thing about business school is that like within a year or two, a lot of the stuff that we were learning was irrelevant. So so I, I definitely lent <laughs> heavily on on uh, on you know mentors and that sort of thing. I was lucky enough to have my my first job. Um, my first and only job realistically uh in Calgary here and uh and my my boss at the time he he kind of allowed me to start taking these steps out you know he allowed me to start taking the steps out from full time to 4 days a week to 3 days a week to 2 days a week etc and he really just kind of believed in me and and, and was on, was giving me a little bit of a nudge and the knowledge that i needed um to kind of take the step out the door so definitely uh mentors have throughout throughout my life um played a huge role in not only the business side of things but also personal and i think i i'm i'm extremely grateful for that opportunity i don't think i would have you know um it, I wasn't in a place where I could step out from a full time paying job to oh hopefully I can sell a video this week. <laughs> so um, <laughs> that that gets very real very fast. Mm-hmm. That's exactly it. So yeah, yeah, very grateful for for a lot of mentors throughout the, throughout the years. I just gotta give a huge prop out to that individual, or if you're listening and you've got someone on your team, and that scarcity mindset of wanting to you know hold them back, and I'm not sure that anyone thinks about that consciously, but just the role that that individual played and allowed you to go to four days, and allowed you to go to three days, and two days, and you know, I know people that, man, I left my company and they became my first client. Like, I don't think that gets celebrated enough, but the security, the safety, the de-risking that that provides for people to go out and break off and do something new, but you can't have a scarcity mindset and do that. I, I find, I don't know, thought, thoughts on that even in your own role now? Yeah, absolutely. No, I think it's important. I think it's it's important to look at the trajectory of the individual. This is how we look at it in our business too, is that like, you know, we've had we've had employees that are, are our top performers and and we've uh they've said, Hey, I'm gonna move on because I have this other opportunity that kind of more aligns with my future. And, you know, I think it's integrally important for leaders of any organization to be like, Hey, you know what? How how can I support you to get there? Even even through you know, as we've had a great two years, but what? How can I support you in the future? And I think that's exactly I'll name him. So James Boucher from Righteous Gelato, he he's the one that kind of kind of nudged me and uh, and oh I'm cool, nice. yeah, yeah. Give me, give me, I, I, this show's all about proper shoutouts. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, I'm eternally grateful for his nudge, and I think we 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 are uh, you know I I hope to practice that for all of my employees as well. Well, I know you. We have a mutual friend, or certainly someone you've had on your show, uh, filming in progress, which we'll talk about in a second. Connor Curran, and I know that they retire the jersey and put it up. You know, which I think is I think is from Zappos. But the first person I heard about it was for Connor, so I'm always going to give him the credit for that. Of like, well, you left here, but that's okay. You still were, you know, memorialized as a as a as a valuable member to the team. Versus this, you left, and so therefore you're dead to me, which seems like such an outdated. Eh, people are messy, so I was, let's we'll leave that. We'll leave that podcast for another day. Um, I'm going to ask you the question that you asked me. I think are you unemployable now oh you know (laughs) there's i'm turning the mic right back at you yeah yeah no doubt no i like it i think um yeah i i think likely i think i think the problem with being a founder and a a ceo and and a you know a problem solver ultimately is kind of how i like to describe myself is is um you're always you know you're kind of 
trying to solve all the problems. So you're creating so many different roles and you're creating so much different work for yourself. And I, and I don't know that that would translate into, you know, a, a job description job. Um, I could be wrong. Maybe there's people that are looking for that. Um, well, c- companies but, yeah. say they want that until they hire us. And they're like, oh my God, can't you just stay in your lane? You're like, whoa, you, we did not align on values here, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Yeah. So it's not something I'm willing to, to test in the near future. That's for sure. Touche, touche for you. How has been, of course, I'm all in on Calgary. I'm a big supporter. Uh, you guys are based here. Clients across the country, clients all over the place. Did, has Calgary embraced, which I find it's such a great city for that. Like, Just talk to me a little bit about, you know, I don't want to call it the Alberta Advantage, but there are some advantages here and some openness that I, I think create open doors that maybe in other more established markets are harder to kick open. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I 100% agree with that. And I think, yeah, I would say probably 60 to 70% of our clientele is based here in Calgary. Uh, we okay. do have uh, we do have a full time team member out in Vancouver, and we do do quite a bit of work uh, in Toronto as well. And I think some of the uh, some of the things that that kind of have stemmed from Calgary, as you said, being a great hub, is that um, I find, and this isn't necessarily the right thing, but I find that a lot of people that are like kind of early in their career or, or mid mid size in their career, they they end up they end up for whatever reason in Vancouver or Toronto, you know, uh, to work for a bigger agency or whatever the case may be. And I think we've actually used that to our advantage a couple of times where, you know, somebody started with a great company here in Calgary and we've, that's been a client. And then they moved to, you know, a different role in, in Toronto, Vancouver, which naturally we get to follow that marketing lead or whatever the case may be to their new position, yep. you know? So it's kind of the spider web effect that we've taken advantage of over the course of the co- past couple of years. Um, we've certainly followed uh, s- some clients to different cities and that sort of thing. So I would say, yeah, the majority of the shooting that we do is here, uh, but we definitely have... Um, we definitely have clients kind of all over the country. We, we do quite a bit of work in the States as well, but most of our clients are based in Canada. I do like the the, 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 the land and expand. They expanded, so you got to go with them. And that is so <laughs> much uh, the secret in this business. Once someone, once you become the trusted partner, you've now just de-risked a huge thing for them and they don't want to take on a new risk, with, which, is, which is a new vendor. Like that's like thinking about it from that perspective, why those relationships are so valuable, <laughs> like do everything you can for the good ones, because they are absolutely worth it. <laughs> uh, curious going way out of my lane here, but talk to me just about the gear. Is it an endless barrage of, we need a new camera? <laughs> Yeah, you know, uh, it, it certainly <laughs> sounds can expensive. Be. It sounds expensive. <laughs> you certainly can find yourself in that in that spot. And there's always the shiny new thing. And the reality is, you know, it's like any tech. It's it's the tech is evolving at a you know weekly rate. So cameras are usually <laughs> released once every, once a year. Or so there's a big um, you know con or whatever for it. Um, it. Yeah, you can definitely fall in that trap, and we have. Um, I think the ultimate thing is uh, you. The thing about um, high level production is we use multiple cameras on each set, right? And which means that there has to be a standard. There has to be a standardized camera for for color and and everything like that. Um, okay. So so when you need you know four or five ca- of the same cameras, <laughs> it's a lot less feasible to kind of drop you know ten, twenty, thirty, fifty, hundred grand on a camera um, once a yeah. year every time they come out. So um, you know most production companies have standards, and there's also industry standards that don't. They're actually kind of outdated, to be honest. The industry standard right now is. Um, you know, a four year old camera, there's definitely new tech that's out there. Um, but yeah, like anything else, the tech kind of, the tech comes out, it's always the shiny new thing. It's always 20 grand more than you want to spend on it. And, um, whether that's (laughs) worth it to your company or not, it's kind of up to you. But the reality is too, is that we're shooting, like even our cameras are about two years old. Um, and we're shooting in 6k, right? And, and okay. TVs are barely like the, the TV standard is barely 4k these days, the monitor standard, even less so. So, um, you know, the bells and whistles don't change that much. It's more about the resolution and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, you can always spend more. You can always, uh, you can standardize it. It's really up to you. Yeah, fair enough. But also just the appreciation when you hire an external partner like a TC media or and you go, oh, why is this so expensive? Uh, you know, as an owner, as as a, as a purchaser of those services, you do need to take into account the reality of what it takes to do it well. They're not shooting it on their iPhone, typically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd hope not. I would hope not. But uh, it, I mean, I won't downplay iPhones either. They're, they've, they've yeah, no, fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely, hundred <laughs> yeah, percent. There's a lot enough. of things that go behind the scenes. You know, even like a lot of people, they, the first thing they think of is cameras and, and lenses and that sort of thing, which is great, of course. Um, but lighting, lighting's very expensive. You yeah. know, crew is expensive. You're looking at twenty five hundred bucks a day for for any decent position. It's it's not it's not a cheap you know cheap spot to be in. 
Um, and there's a lot of things that go behind the scenes. And like I said, kind of circling back to the beginning of the conversation, um, you know, if somebody comes to me, uh, I've had this question before where people are like, are you offended when somebody comes and says, hey, I have a thousand bucks? Um, and the answer is no. And the reason is because they just don't know any better, you know? And, and I'm sure there is somebody out there that can do it for a thousand bucks. You might not get the quality of the product that you're looking for. It's fine. Um, but it really comes down to the education piece that I was talking about before. It's it's how can we educate this customer to make sure that they know that they're, what they're spending is actually, you know, going somewhere. I think we could have a whole episode just about the concept of being offended and how ridiculous that is unto itself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm offended that you're offended. It's a John Cleese interview from years back where he said he would stop, stop playing universities and stop playing these kind of institutions because he goes, you know, to be comedic, you have to be on the edge of offensive. And if every time I get offended, I try to get canceled, then come on, like you have to be willing to be pushed. I know that's a funny concept. I, I, I take offense sometimes to be people that are offended too easily. Someone doesn't know, <laughs> it's still, you know, you can't, it, it, it just it becomes so elitist. Oh my god, I can't believe they thought it was this. Maybe they just didn't know, and you were the person who was going to help them understand. <laughs> but that's a that's my own philosophical views around the term offended. Talk to me a little bit about filming in progress. Taking your own medicine, drinking your own Kool Aid. What is filming in progress uh, aside aside from even just going through your website, seeing the signs that were on set, and then all of a sudden being a guest on filming in progress was kind of fun. So talk to me even about that decision to go. Hey, we're going to go all in on our own content and do our do our own thing, but for our, for ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think ultimately the idea stemmed from the fact that we have never done marketing. The past seven years we've been around, we haven't marketed ourselves at all. And, um, you know, we've put out what, uh, what industry is called spec work. So, you know, videos that kind of promote ourselves a little bit here and there, and maybe our annual reel, which I think over the course of seven years, we maybe have put out three. So, um, you know, we're really bad at marketing ourselves. And I think ultimately it was, it was extended from an idea of how can we use it not only to market what we do, but also our, more so our expertise, which is kind of going back through that, like, you know, everybody can create a great video, but what, what makes you stand apart? Our expertise is, and our team's expertise, sorry, rather is very important there. So filming in progress is essentially an idea that stemmed out of that. It's, it's how can we get in front of the right people? How can we have incredible conversations? How can we share those conversations with the world and people who may need our services, but but ultimately just talk about um, you know business and, and that sort of thing? And and so the original idea was getting in front of the right people, and and then it stemmed to this thing that's like wow, though, wow, people want to be on it, people are actually listening, all these things, and and so it's just creating this kind of web effect that we honestly didn't even anticipate. Um, and, and we're looking at, you know, making it into a revenue stream and obviously being a video production company, it's, it's extremely important. The production is, is high value and, and creating, you know, season two is actually going to move more into a little bit of more story-based content. So to be on, to answer your question, it stemmed from a marketing effort. Um, it's moving more so into kind of a show is kind of where we want to take it. We want to spend half a day with the individual and what their, what their day looks like, what their business truly looks like and that sort of thing. So more of a, a YouTube show, if you will, than, than a podcast, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, it's ever evolving. Uh, we have tons of ideas and, 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 uh, we'll see where it takes us, but, um, it really is our first effort at trying to market ourselves and just get in front of the right people. Well, I was I was honored to be invited on as a guest. I had a great time. It was a ton of fun. And I loved seeing what you guys did with the content afterwards to really like not ex not over not underplay that point. We spent an hour in the room, but the time the way you took that and used it to create something that was in in interesting and again, I sound very narcissistic. Oh, it was so interesting to see myself. It was very interesting to how you slice it up and how you help tell a story in snippets. You took sixty minutes and turned it into little 15 to 30 second snippets that each told their own story. I thought you guys did a phenomenal job at that and really like huge high five for the audience. So one hour of filming, how much can that cost? Talk to me about post, how much time, if, you know, and is there a formula that you kind of play with? If there's one hour in front of the camera, it's X amount of time to, you know, as you've said, where you take it to this multiple, multi-piece, multi-pronged usable series of content pieces. What's the investment afterwards against that one hour of camera time? Yeah, I mean, I it, I would say it certainly depends on the project, but I can speak mm -hmm. specifically to a to a video podcast kind of a kind of scenario. Um, a rule of thumb, I would say across industry is three to four times in post than than on site. Okay, uh, that's kind of what we use as a rule of thumb. But that being said, you know, if it's a really complicated project, it could be eight. It depends on how many special effects you're doing. If it's really yeah. simple, it could be one to one. I would I would say kind of four is a safe bet. Um, 
for for video podcasts specifically, it's very interesting, especially if you're doing some editing, right? Because uh, you you have to listen to it and you have to kind of mark items. And and the reality is the actual cutting down the interview. For example, if if uh, I as the host stumble or something like that, um, then then we're gonna we're gonna chop that out, right? Um, that's simple. What 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 really takes the time is kind of marking these these elements where oh we can make a story out of this, and maybe there's a thing something that the guest said later on that would add to this point. And and realistically, like I think throughout an entire conversation a lot of the same points are touched on or similar enough that we can get we can get a unique perspective on a single idea uh throughout the interview so so as you mentioned kind of splicing those things together in a, in a creative way and, and telling a bit of a different story that you wouldn't get in the full episode that you might get in 30 seconds um not to not to you know skew words or anything like that but but make it make it a, t- a teaser you know pe- people after watching a teaser they, they want to go and watch the full thing and that's the idea um, a lot of people t- start, forget to take into account uh, attention spans and attention spans <laughs> these days are so incredibly short, you know, um, unless unless we've really enticed you with a strong, strong snippet or teaser that's sub 30 seconds at most, um, you're not going to watch the full thing. And that's ultimately the goal. Right. So um, how can we create smaller pieces of content that make you want to, you know, click through that funnel? Um, that, you know, that's what we're here for. We always joke, you know, it's the, the rule of three. It takes a third of a second to get to get three seconds to get three minutes. And you can break those numbers out anytime you want. But most of us, that third of a second is like that's scrolling Instagram, that's looking at LinkedIn, that's pow, 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 pow. How do we, how do you go, uh, oh, oh, I'm curious enough to even that there is a win. And that's a huge win to get that first that 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 first pause. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about you you talked about you, you clarified, you know, I didn't really leave. We were working on other projects. And just from a startup and a founder perspective. The risk of distraction, the risk of trying, the risk of not trying new things, the risk of being distracted by new things. It's, it's, there's many angles on this sword. I think it has multiple sides, but I know you've got another company called Pronto that I was, I was looking at this morning. Talk to me a little bit about your lessons learned and your journey of, you know, this is who we are. Oh, but we're going to try this. How beneficial that was versus how do you balance the risk of, oh, wow, that really took our eye off the ball or man, we put our eye over here. And that was actually proved to be a way better idea. How do you manage that? How do you navigate that as a founder? Yeah, really interesting question. I was just having having a great conversation about this yesterday with my EO group. And um, so, you know, I I think we've made the mistake before where, and I think many people have, where it's like the shiny new thing, you know, shiny new thing syndrome, where it's like, oh, we got to put all of our eggs in that basket because that thing's going to scale and that thing's going to work or whatever the case may be. And uh, we've been guilty to that. And I think... um, you know, one of the things that I've learned over that time is we had a steady, stable, you know, inclining business and it was, it was not fast, but it wasn't, it was, it was going the right direction. Um, it had steady, stable growth. And I think we, we, uh, moved too many resources from, from that business to something that was new and shiny, uh, with the hopes that it would scale fast. And you know what it did, it did for a year and a half. (laughs) And then, and then, you know, uh, and then that shiny new thing is no longer a shiny new thing. It's a shiny old thing, or it's, you know, it's a dusty old thing. And that's what happened to us. And then we were left (laughs) with, um, we were left with, uh, you know, this, this, uh, stagnant, steady business that, that hadn't made any progress in the past year and a half. And it took some resources to get it back and running. Right. So I think, um, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with with. I, in fact, I would definitely encourage taking those risks and finding those opportunities and fully, you know, exploring them. Um, I think yeah, my experience is that make sure that you know you're not you're not neglecting the uh, the thing that got you to that that found that uh, that new opportunity in the first place. Um, if I were to go back and change anything, it would be to you know make sure that I had the resources in place to to continue that that steady business. Uh, well, well, further exploring the other one, but. Uh, you know, um, putting all your eggs in, ba- in one basket in any scenario, I don't think is a good idea. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that perspective. Uh, how much do you think also the paradigm of, you know, founder syndrome is to start and do new things to run and scale the business sometimes feels like a different skill. And I know even myself, like, oh, am I the right person for this? You know, I've had leadership coaches like, well, there's no one better <laughs> than you. But, and there's sometimes that imposter syndrome, we get just our own internal dialogues of like, well, I want to create, I want to do new. I'm not the guy who's going to run this. Maybe I'm not the person who's going to scale, the guy or gal that's going to scale this. Has that been any part of the journey for you? And you mentioned EO and I have been in, I've been in tech for years as an executive group. Having those peer groups oftentimes can provide a really good mirror to those exact situations where I often hear those conversations have maybe more honesty than they do out in the world. 
Yeah, a hundred percent. Those groups have always been. I mean, this, transparently, this is my first. Uh, this is my first like kind of formal group, and and I've you know That's I've you. truly yeah. enjoyed the the experience this year so far. Um, and, but beyond that, mentors are kind of providing the same thing, like we discussed earlier. You know that that external perspective. Maybe they've had a little bit more more uh, experience in that in that area. But yeah, I, I mean, I I don't. I think. I think ultimately trust your gut. You know, I think if 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 something's steady and stable and, and you're no longer getting fulfillment out of it as as a founder, then there's I don't think there's anything wrong to kind of move on to another thing. Uh, but I do think that it's it's important to kind of self reflect before you do so and make sure that hey, is is this something that I'm ready to do? You know, is it the shiny new thing or is it or is it the new thing for me and I'm done here? I really I really have a hard time splitting my attention personally. Uh, and I think a lot of founders are like that. I, I mean, kudos to the people that can kind of successfully run four different businesses at the same time. But for me to truly run something and feel fulfilled and ensure that uh, it's doing the best that I know it can do, it requires my full attention. And so um, I think, uh, you know, if I'm going to look at that new opportunity, which I do, absolutely, I'm always open to the next thing. Um, but I want to make sure that, it, you know, if I'm going to jump ship, I'm going to jump ship and I'm going to make sure that that's the decision I'm making rather than, oh, I might dabble over here and we'll see what happens. The one foot in each boat never ends well for the guy in the middle, right? <laughs> Nailed it. Yeah, I love Is that. Is that something like you speak to it very clearly now and very concisely? And I really appreciate that as, as yes, I've been through this. Has that always been clear to you? Or was there some moments when you were like, whoa, okay, I got to have a fireside chat with myself here and kind of work through that. This thinking about people listening, going, yeah, yeah, that's fine for you. But I can, you know, was there a moment when you were like, either the world hits you and said, hey, uh, Aiden, this isn't working. Or did you hit yourself with that paddle before someone else hit you with it? <laughs> Uh, yeah. So, uh, two answers to the same question, I suppose. Um, both, I, I, you know, I've been hit personally <laughs> and realized it myself. Uh, and I've also had some, in, you know, some very, uh, important interventions, uh, interventions, you know, loosely with my, with my <laughs> yep, business partner. Like He's it. like, Hey man, uh, you know, I'm, where's, where's your time going? And you know, if you're not in this, it's, it's cool, but, um, that's a decision that you need yeah. to make and, and make that decision. Right. And I think, you know, I, I'm very great, grateful to have an incredible business partner who, uh, who we were very clear communicative com communication is extremely important between us. And, um, I think that was, a, that was a kind of shot in the head. It was like, Oh shoot, you know, I am spending, uh, whatever, 30% of my time over here. And is that what I want to do? And I think so to answer your question, yeah, both I've definitely come to it myself. I've definitely been kind of hitting the head with somebody else telling me that, you know, um, not necessarily that it's a bad thing, but make a decision. And I think, uh, yeah, I, I think as long as you're making a decision consciously, and if you're okay with that, if you're okay splitting your time 70-30 or 50-50 or 60-40, whatever the case may be, um, there's nothing wrong with that. But just make sure that you're consciously aware of where your time's going and where your priorities lie. How deliberate are you being versus happenstance, right? And and that That's distraction it. can start slowly and grow. There's no question about it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you you touched on something, and I think you and I chatted about it in R, because it's a huge secret to my success and, and a power... Uh, part of my source of my superpowers. <laughs> That's a funny thing to say out loud, but my business partner, like love him. He's my brother. Uh, he's my dysfunctional marriage. He's my best marriage I've ever been in kind of joke. We talk about how long have you been, uh, like how critical has business partner been to you? you? You just alluded to very positively the role it's played for you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so yeah. Seven years with him um, and a little bit of working relationship before that, before we actually decided to become business partners. And uh, yeah, absolutely integral. I, you know, um, people can speak highly and, and poorly of business partners. Uh, my experience has been nothing but positive. Um, nice. You know, you need somebody that that kind of pushes you in in ways that you wouldn't push yourself. And I think I think ultimately we we are completely different people. We think about things completely differently. We have completely varying you know um, perspectives nice. on things. And, sounds and very people, familiar, Aiden. I, that sounds very familiar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and you hear all the time, oh, that sounds like awful and whatever. And it, no, it's incredible because we push we push each other in ways that we wouldn't. We're extremely clear and, and communicative, and uh, and I think that's integral. Like I really don't think the business would be would be where it would is today without either of our inputs. Um, I think the biggest thing you you deal with when you're kind of going into that situation, into a business partner situation with uh, with two drastically different people, is what roles are we going to take? Um, you know, who's who's going to take helm? Who's going to? Are we going to co CEO? Uh, you know, is that going to work? Whatever the case may be, um, I think kind of clear clarifying those you know those uh, guidelines, I suppose, or or even those boundaries up front is integrally important. And then knowing kind of where the power lies and who makes what decisions and that sort of thing, because then that person is responsible. And as long as you know who's responsible, then you know how to improve discipline, whatever the case may be. So um, yeah, I think uh, I think my experience with my business partner has been absolutely incredible. And uh, yeah, grateful for that. 
I love, I couldn't agree with you more the clarity on roles. And, you know, sometimes even in, in my business, I think we chatted about it on, on the show is like, you know, I'm CEO, but you're creative director, but we're both shareholders. So let's talk about our CEO and talk about like it was almost like role playing to almost a silly level. But in the early days, it's what, what was required. What recommended, you know, I, your recommendation around be clear on roles, be clear on responsibilities, be clear on who's accountable for what, which I think that's critical for any team members you're bringing on in the early days, which often get overlooked in the state of growth and chaos at all costs. What about values? How do you recommend? I'm in the early days. I met someone. We're deciding to get serious about our business relationship. <laughs> how do you? How would you recommend? Or how did you identify values alignment or misalignment early on? Because you find out over time whether you like it or not. But in the uh, to force the find out part can be really tricky. Any any comments on that or re- yeah. advice recommends? Yeah, I mean, I, I I don't know that I can I can speak to the early days because transparently, I think we were lucky. I don't think either of us did the work to kind of understand each other's values early on. Uh, so in that in that regard, I think we're super lucky. Now, you know, maybe four or five years in is where we started to do the work because we were like, okay, we have something here, but it takes both of us. And, nice. you know, we both need to be 100% in to make this work. And so that's when we, you know, we started doing reading and we started kind of having those those value chats and understanding each other on a more deep level to make sure that we're aligned. Because... Um, I think I think it's kind of the it's one of those ideas that you know you can get to you can get to a single ledge with with uh, two people no matter who you are or what you're doing right so let's let's analogy of like a, a mountain climb right two of you can get to a certain point no problem but to get to maybe the next peak it's going to be a little bit harder it's going to you know you're going to have to put in a little bit more work and and the two of you're going to have to work together a little bit better and so uh, that's the work that we did you know four or five years in and that's when we found out that we're actually super aligned uh, from a value perspective. And, um, and I think, you know, it would be awesome to do that work up front. But like you said, I think it does take time. I don't think you could, you know, know 100% if it's going to be the right fit right off the bat. Um, but, you know, be, be prepared to put the work in for sure. Because, you know, where you don't want to be is 10 years deep where you're having very critical conversations and, and you know, maybe not sure that this is the right fit. Well, because now you're halfway up the mountain, you you know it's too far to go back, but you and and almost and and overwhelming to go forward, but you're stuck. Like you're you're you know that that first cliff, you can just you can you can you can rope back down before the end of the day, but you're deep in the backcountry now. <laughs> to keep on that metaphor, we've had boating, we've had mountain climbing, we're pulling some good metaphors in here. <laughs> there we go. Did you use a was that a guided process you used at that time, or did you literally go for a hike in the mountains? You know, because my business partner and I have done that over the years. Like, okay, it's Friday afternoon, let's just drive to Canmore and go for a hike and talk about and talk about stuff. And we've also had coaches that have interviewed uh, that have uh, I want to say intervened but have supported us with like hey maybe this is a blind spot uh, has it been a blend for you of those uh, it's, it's a huge bag of tricks you can pull from for that yeah 100% definitely a blend for us as well we're 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 similar to you you know we're we're very avid outdoors uh people so we we would go on a hike or we would take a couple of days off and nice. just go get a lodge in in you know uh Jasper or whatever the case may be uh just to kind of realign and we and we we do that quite frequently now uh now more than ever actually just make sure that we're still aligned and make sure that we're going in the right direction collectively um so yeah that 100 percent. so the very casual approach we've also definitely done programs um more so from the business perspective so kind of like you know business direction and that sort of thing that, that they've helped us with um but those also help us with personal alignments because they ask the right questions right so i think i, I don't necessarily think there's a right way to do it i think as long as you are doing the work and having those vulnerable conversations and being honest first of all with yourself but then with your partner um you know it'll be it'll be all good or not yeah, and that's bu- better to determine bu- 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 <laughs> before yeah yeah but bu- uh, bullshitting yourself or others does not have any seat at that table <laughs> it because it you know, and so does everyone else usually when it's happening. Uh, what You mentioned EO. You said your first time joining a formal group, obviously having mentors and, and key people in your life. What was the impetus to join? You know, It's time, it's money, it's commitment. A lot of people shy away from it. It's been a game changer for me. I've been in tech off. I was in EO in the early days, but tech off and on for since 2011, mm-hmm. uh, which is another form of executive group. What was the impetus to start that? And like, it, has it been worth it in terms of time and energy and cost? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, integral. I, 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 um, it's always been something that I've wanted to join, but I just never kind of, and sorry, not EO specifically, but just any group, you know, it's, I've always mm-hmm. seen the yep. value of, of a business community and groups and that sort of thing. And, um, I just never really took the plunge and I hadn't even heard of EO until, um, this past summer. And then, uh, it's kind of what, you know, when you, when you see a car passing down the street, you see it for the first time, <laughs> then you car, see it three times. That, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, that's exactly what happened. I would had three unique conversations with three unique people that were like, Hey, you'd be a good, fit. you know, you should consider this, whatever. Um, and so I did and, uh, just kind of hopped right in and, and, you know, it's been incredible. I think the, the, the support of like-minded business people is just, 
the support, but also the the community. I think ultimately the biggest thing that I'm getting out of it is that a lot of these things that you know entrepreneurs and founders and that sort of thing go through or experience um, are, are unique to founders and CEOs and and you know that sort of thing. So uh, it's it's tough to talk to your 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 friends uh, out so that aren't aren't these people uh, about these issues or or even just you know have a common understanding on a deeper level about these these things that the other people are going through. Um, and hearing their perspectives and that sort of thing has just been invaluable. So I, I have nothing but great things to say. And I, you know, not specific to any group, but any, any, any group, however it's run, as long as it's, you know, got those core community foundation and, um, I'm sure it's going to be a good experience. You ever had the moment when you're at a you know dinner table or dinner party or gather with some really good friends and they're kind of complaining about their work or they're complaining about their boss. And all of a sudden you're like, it's actually like you're complaining right about me right now. I can really empathize with your boss and what he's what he or she are probably going through that you're bitching about. <laughs> yeah. Not yeah. bad, not good. Just like I'm like, huh. Could I offer another opinion here? It doesn't always go over well. They just want you to go, yes, that's terrible. That boss is a terrible person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um yeah. anyways, a little bit tongue in cheek there for sure, but not. Um Okay, we're forty. We're forty-four minutes in. If people are still listening, they're they're connected. If your ICP, your ideal customer profile, is on here right now, describe to me the perfect project for you. You're like, oh, if this if this person is listening right now, this is what we would love to do for you. Let's 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 wrap on that on that note. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's in, interesting. We always get asked the question, "How do you segment your customers?" And, and the the reality is, we don't we don't segment by industry, uh, which is very unique to to uh, marketing or, or video services, whatever the case may be. And the reason for that is because we think there's a unique perspective to take on any industry, and you can and you can translate any um, you know tactic or whatever the case may be from one to the other, and it'll work. Uh, it'll work just as well. So. So the way we segment our customers is um, is what we call by raising a ruckus. If you want to raise your ruckus, then we want to work with you. And but what that means is, you know, if you want to push the envelope, if you want to do something different, etc. Um, what we don't like to do is is work on projects where uh, a client comes to us and they said, "Look at this incredible video. Can we copy this for us?" That's that's a red flag for us. You know, they don't they're they're thinking kind of in a box, and and that's not what they like to do. So first of all, that would be the biggest thing is you know, do you want to do something u- new? Do you want to do something unique? Yeah, we can take we can draw inspiration from multiple things, but but uh, let's let's implement some new tactics and new ideas. Um, as far as ideal project, that's that's tough. I would love to I would love to translate industries. You know, I'd love to take things that we've done for a car commercial to you know, a coffee mug commercial or whatever the case may be. Those, the, that's what interests me. Uh, let's break some boundaries. Let's have some fun doing it. And let's, let's uh, create some, create some memories, but also get you some impressions on that video. I love it. I love it. I'm not sure if, if you're a motorcycle guy or but Honda does have a motorcycle called the ruckus. So I don't know. I think I see for you for further conversations in our future. <laughs> love it. Love it. <laughs> and what's the best way for people to one, learn more about you, get in touch and also, uh, YouTube, obviously, uh, filming in progress, get, throw out your, throw out your hooks, throw out your links. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. To see, to see media.ca is our website, uh, to see made it on all social media platforms. Um, uh, you can find, you know, filming in progress, everything on uh, there to see made it, uh, to see mm-hmm. made it. Yep, you bet. And then uh, me personally, I'm trying to be a little bit more active on LinkedIn. So feel free to to hit me up there. I'm Aiden Campbell on LinkedIn. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to trying to post there a couple times a week. So we'll see what happens. It's that one social media platform that I still people don't feel guilty about using. Oh, geez, I wasted my time on Instagram. Oh, I did. You know, I wasted my time on TikTok. But YouTube, I learned uh, you know, LinkedIn's for business. You're right. It's def- it definitely seems to be shifting its way and kind of maintaining that degree of kind of credibility in the business community. No question. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Aiden, one Hey, thanks again for having me on your show. It's an absolute pleasure to come on. That was a great conversation. I love the work you do. I love your energy and I love the impact you're having in our city. So I'm really happy to come on and help you to share your story. Thank you, Tyler. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate it. 